right. Well, thank you very much to both of our speakers this afternoon. We do have time for some questions. So if our speakers would like to join us maybe on stage, uh, and we have the microphones on uh, in either aisle. So if you have questions, go ahead and make your way to the microphones as the speakers make their way up here. I suppose to start things off a little bit, I'll have a question for Professor Velker. I know in recent years it has become increasingly common for Protestant theologians to use the concept of theosis or deification when talking about the spirit's role in salvation. Uh, I may very well have missed it, but it didn't sound to me as though you were drawing on deification categories or language in your presentation. So I'm just curious to know whether or not you find deification to be a useful concept for talking about the spirit's role in salvation. Yeah. Well, I would prefer to speak in a, in a, in a more nuanced way about deification by really being uh, drawn into uh, the life of Christ, into the power of the Spirit, into new creation, uh, um, so, so, so that we have a more specific perspective on the deification. So I have um, a, a lot of reserve against very um, yeah, opaque um, a, a notions where uh, you get these grandiose visions. Oh, we are become, you know, God. Uh, uh, and and uh, I, would, I would like to have uh, um, a clearer perspective on what deification, theosis, really means in specific contexts. So on the whole, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm with my orthodox uh, um, brothers and sisters uh, uh, that this is a very important topic. But on the other hand, I'm a little shy over against very mm. vague metaphysical or mystical notions of unity um, mm -hmm. with the divine or, yeah. Okay, can I assume then you'd have similar reservations for any of the language with union, union with Christ, participation, of all of those same categories? No, not okay. at all. Um, but I think what, what is so strong with the uh, work of the Spirit is always the differentiated unity. Mm. Yeah? So the figure of the pouring is always with me. The constitution of the body of Christ with different members. The p specific participation in Christ's life and Christ, so that we are members of his body. Uh, and then when Christ is in us and we are in Christ, uh, we uh, should not be confused with Christ, but should have a differentiated unity with him. And so I'm very uh, interested in um, specific um, experience-friendly um, notions of the participation in the divine life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. For your presentation. Uh, the question is regarding uh, the tension, at least, that I heard between the image of uh, the spirit as outpouring versus uh, love as self-withdrawing. And so maybe the question is in, in how I'm hearing that, um, yeah. but uh, self-withdrawing sounds like the nature of the self uh, is inherently in competition uh, or inherently violent. So I was just wondering if you could clarify that, uh, that okay. distinction? No, um, um, uh, my point was that, um, um, well, first, the, the notion of the pouring of the spirit um, uh, aims at the constitution of a differentiated community. And even when we say the spirit has been poured into our heart, that means that uh, the spirit comes into our rich identity. So the heart is, is not a reference point in us, as many people say, oh, it's the middle of us or so. It's too little. The heart is full of emotional, cognitive, and voluntative energies. It's a very rich dimension in our life. And when we say the spirit is pawn into our heart, uh, it is an in living power that addresses our emotional, cognitive, Voluntative energies inspires our, our body, inspires our our soul, inspires our spirit, our conscience, and so on. So I would like to keep this, and this resonates with the que the answer to um, uh, the question I was just asked. Also, the richness of our anthropological dimensions. 
So this is the point, pouring, constituting community, constituting the richness of our uh, personal life. Then, I argue, life that we very often associate only positively has a dual dimension. Life can be wonderful, but also life Natural life lives at the expense of other life. As Whitehead says, life is a robbery. Life has to live at the expense of other life. Even if you are vegetarian, you have to live by destroying other life in order to sustain yourself. So this is a very sobering <coughs> notion. And my point is, <clears throat> in the power of love and forgiveness, we have a kind of counter move <clears throat> against the basic tendency of life to live at the expense of other life. And this is, a, uh, it seems paradoxical, counterintuitive. In love, you live by self-withdrawing, free and creatively self-withdrawing in favor of the other. In love, we respect the freedom of the beloved. We want the unfolding. Yeah? So this kind of love, I know what is good for you. Well, of course, in puberty time, uh, we need this, uh, maybe sometimes. <laughs> but normally the love is the enjoyment. I want you to flourish and then get the response. And, uh, and of course, the ideal form is that we mutually engage in mutual growth and uh, the exchange of this identity. But it's a counterintuitive against the tendency of life to grab, to grab, and to self-sustain. Yeah. And the wonderful, wonderful insight is that in love, you move beyond your life by withdrawing in favor of the other, in love and forgiveness. And these are powers of the spirit, uh, powers of the spirit which draw us into a life beyond the finite, robbery, self-sustaining type of life. And here you see the connection to salvation. We are drawn into a life that moves beyond earthly, finite, self-asserting type of life. Uh, <clears throat> this is for Dr. Wainwright. I appreciate very much the uh, enriching overview that you gave us of the spirit in the liturgical practice of the church. Question comes up, and I'm sure it's not uh, foreign to you. Uh, in scripture, uh, it seems very difficult to find any reference to the spirit being addressed other than in invocation. I'm thinking of petitionary prayer, where that you can find multiple references to the Father being addressed to the Son in certain texts, especially in the Johannine literature. But prayer to, petitionary prayer to the Holy Spirit do you have any thoughts or comments on that particular issue, even though uh, the references that you gave seem not to have covered that particular dimension? Thank you. I think that's a true observation, yes, that uh, it is chiefly by invocation for aid or something of that sort that the spirit is most usually addressed in the scriptures. I think that's right. and. Even in the many prayers that I gave, a lot of them were invocations for aid. It wasn't, they weren't all addressing praise and glory, though a few of them were. Right. Well, I also have a question for Dr. Wayne, right? As you've looked at the kind of the grammar of the Holy Spirit across different traditions, and you drew on a wide variety of traditions in your presentation, do you notice any differences in, in the, the, the grammar, the, the liturgical grammar of, between the different traditions? Uh, is the grammar different in the Orthodox tradition than the Anglican tradition in, in any discernible way? Yeah, on the whole, it's sort of pretty high churchmen who invoke the spirit and pretty low churchmen, I would say, uh, on the whole, whereas the whole central body of the majority even perhaps of, of church members and so mm -hmm. don't in public worship very readily mention or invoke the Holy Spirit. 
Is that your experience too? Well, I think we associate prayer um, uh, very, very often, at least in my traditions, with very personalistic forms. Yeah? So here is another, um, Gordon Kaufmann had this point of reference, God the ultimate point of reference. And we have it in anthropology and in theology that we have two points of reference in contact. Whereas I think the biblical thinking is much richer. Yeah. But we, and, and, sorry. Yeah, and also the classical notions of personhood, we were asked for personhood. Classical notions of personhood are associated with the strange form that we yeah, have shy away, the mask. And that means the, the interface between our intimate self-reference that we always associate in modernity with personhood and the public personhood with all the radiances in which you are. Yeah? And to see that when we address a person, we do not just address a reference point, but a whole realm. This is problematic for modern mindsets. But when we evoke the Holy Spirit, we evoke the divine power that comes and surrounds us from all sides. So I think it's very important that dealing with the divine, we have on the one hand the encounter, um, the Christological encounter, personhood, that we can really address God as a thou, uh, uh, and so on. But the power of God is richer than that. And the problem that people have with the invoking of the Holy Spirit in general is by uh, invoking a power coming and surrounding us and carrying us is much more complicated for our imagination. I would love us Methodists, at least, to enter more fully again into the Wesleyan verses of concerning the Holy Spirit, where, in fact, it's not isolated at all, but it's, it's always interwoven yeah. with the Trinity, with the work right. of Christ, uh, and with the whole of personal and communal life. It's, yeah. It's very, a very widespread of usage in, in the Charles Wesley hymns in particular. Yeah. I think if we could uh, develop our imaginations when we speak or when we address also the elevated Christ, it's always Christ in the power of his spirit. And Christ with the rain and his members and the glory and so on. It's not just here is Christ, the reference point, and then also, sorry, oh, there was also some glory. No, it's the Lord and the realm. And I think if we could move our piety a little bit more into these dimensions, uh, we would have a much more doxological life. But of course, this requires a lot of rethinking, also about our Trinitarian thought if it's just three reference points. Yeah? We had a lot of discussion about the difficulties with Trinitarian thought. Well, a lot of Trinitarian thought was just I-thou relation. Yeah? God, Trinity, I-thou relation. God, humans, I-thou relation. Humans, other human, I-thou relation. Well, that's a very, very poor kind of uh, theology. And this then drops below the level of common sense. And this is a problem in a lot of our faith, contemporary faith, that uh, uh, we have these simplistic figures of thought that cannot address the richness of human personhood, the richness of our um, inter-individual life, the richness of the divine. And I think here, uh, uh, yeah, dealing with the Holy Spirit and rethinking the divinity in the power of the Spirit will help us. And I think the, the, the uh, secret of the great strength through the uh, Pentecostal traditions is that they have glimpses of this. And the problem of our Western traditions is that we have too much reductionistic theological thinking. And then we try to um, yeah, activate it by the numinous or whatever, and then you are drawn between the vagueness and, 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 and the stupidity. And uh, <laughs> this is a problem. There's a book title in there somewhere. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, my question is, um, when we talk about the Holy Spirit and salvation, 
how can we understand the power of the Spirit or the role of the Holy Spirit on the cross? Can we uh, truly see the crucifixion as a Trinitarian event? And um, in my mind, I'm thinking of um, Moltmann's explanation of Mark 15, um, when, the, when the son um, gave his spirit away, or translated differently, um, breathed his last, and how the Roman centurion um, responded seemingly oddly by saying, truly this was the son of God. And that was the son's um, withdrawal, self-withdrawal of his unique sonship with the father and how that was the demonstration of his love for on, on behalf of humanity. And um, could you, uh, if you have any thoughts on like how we can see the presence of the Holy Spirit on the crucifixion and um, can you share some thoughts on that? Thank you. Okay. Well, um, you, you um, yeah, raise a very, very difficult question. And uh, I know that um, yeah, very important colleagues like Moltmann, Jüngel, and so on, they always try to bring together the cross and the, and the trinity. And I found more problems than answers into these attempts. Um, for me, an honest approach to the theology of the cross was that I um, um, looked at it into, yeah, uh, with respect to the life of Christ and, and saw that the biblical notions tell us that Jesus is brought to the cross in the name of the global power, in the name of religion, in the name of two types of law, Roman and uh, the Jewish law, in the name of public opinion, and even the disciples forsake. Here what we see at the cross is the world under the power of sin. Because all the powers, religion, politics, law, public opinion, morals, friends, they all collapse. I think this is yeah, the sober notion of the, then you say, well, is it correlated with uh, fleeing and withdrawing of the spirit? And here we have these notions of ekpnein, pneuma paedoken, but the exegetes tell us, well, we are insecure, whether you can really say it's the Holy Spirit or it's only the human spirit of Christ. Yeah? So I think here we are still knocking on closed doors, so to speak, when we try to see what happens to the Trinitarian life with respect to the cross. And um, uh, I think that the, um, the element of the suffering God, God experienced death and so on, is an important element, but it doesn't show us the whole dimension of the cross. I think it's very important that we see the cross reveals us the world under the power of sin and really the situation of God forsakenness. Yeah? And out of this abyss <coughs> yeah, where God, the loving God, experience hate. The creative God experienced destruction. So God reached God's limits, so to speak. Then we have the great secret and wonder of the resurrection. And the resurrection, not as ta-ta-ta-ta, here comes the hero. No, breaking of the bread, command to baptism, greeting of the peace, disclosing the scripture. Yeah. Luther has this wonderful phrase, geheimlich führt er sein Gewalt. Yeah. In a secret way, God exercises God's power. And he wins the disciples in the power of the Spirit into his community. So this is what I, what I see happening at cross and resurrection. Yeah. But when you say, well, at the point of the cross, yeah, can we get a Trinitarian theology? I don't see it yet. But I, I also see, it, uh, see the problems that given the figures of thought I just uh, depicted, yeah, we have still the situation that great Schleiermacher named the, um, um, the Trinity and the doctrine of the Trinity is a building site. Yeah? The doctrine of the Trinity is still very much under labor, because we, we are so much drawn by either these um, um, 
either love figures, which are a minimum, and, and I, of course, use them also in class and with Bart and Brunner and so on and so on, uh, or you have these perichoretic unions, Maltman, Social Trinity, and, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, I think we have one more powerful form, which interestingly has not been uh, really unfolded very much. Luther uh, says it occasionally, that the Trinity is a relation where the Father speaks the word and the Holy Spirit joins. Der Vater spricht das Wort und der Heilige Geist stimmt ein. That's a different form, because here you can think the personhood of all three. Yeah? Whereas with the other form of the Trinity, we always say the relation of the Spirit, how is he, uh, yeah, in, a, in an adequate way, in a similar personhood, and so on and so on. So you see, I'm, I'm now almost speaking in tongues. But <laughs> this is the situation of our Trinitarian theology. Yeah? And the situation is blocked also by reductionistic notions of personhood, uh, by deficiencies in, in pneumatology, and so on and so on. But yeah, events like yours help to open our eyes, and sometimes it's uh, much more uh, important to open our eyes to a multitude of difficulties than to two simple and not real solutions. I'm just wondering whether we have people waiting for us. Outside, do we? I don't think so. What's the program? We're good. We're good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry? We're okay. We have a few minutes. You still have five minutes or so. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. I tripped over my briefcase. I got so. <laughs> um, well, that prompts my question then. Uh, is this a, the, this oversimplification and, and all of the downsides of, is that, is that an, an unfortunate casualty of the Trinitarian Renaissance then? I mean, because now, there was a long time when no one talked about the Trinity and then all of a sudden everyone's talking about the Trinity. I, maybe you would reflect on maybe the positives and the negatives of the last 30 years in that. Well, I think that the um, pneumatological concentration and the um, um, uh, risen interest in the spirit and, and the working of the spirit, and also the, uh, a lot of Christological um, yeah. uh, uh, work, has helped us to yeah, move into a Trinitarian um, uh, uh, theology that is more um, uh, promising and more lively. Um, I think the big problem that we still have is the first person of the Trinity. People always think here we are on safe grounds, but very often we have an abstract theism, the principle, the ground of being, then all the metaphysical things, the confusion of God with the first person, and so all this comes in. So I think that um, um, here we have a, a, a very, very important area to uh, unfold, and I'm very glad that you have the image of God mm -hmm. next year. Because with the image of God, you have to somehow unpack it. Yeah. Is the image of God an image of the Trinity? Is the image of God an image of Christ? How can it be an image of the Spirit? How can it be an image of the Creator? Uh, uh, what do we make of, of uh, Genesis 1? Um, I created them as female and male. Uh, and so on and so on. So here you have a very rich uh, uh, area to explore that might also add uh, uh, to uh, get back on the, on the complicated topic of, of the Trinity. I think one of the most interesting developments, at least among groups with whom I mix, is not the word one baptism, one church, because I put a question mark by that, but word and table, bringing the two together, word and table. And the more those two can be brought together in the lives of congregations, communities, the livelier the church will be. Hmm. All right, well, unless anyone else wants to lunge for the microphone, let's um, thank our speakers for this afternoon. <laughs>